He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Voice of Tangaroa is a collaboration between New Zealand Geographic and RNZ. Reporting for this series is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. The deficit of wild harvest of any species has to be made up by farming. I wish you could just stick them in a tank and let them breed, but it's a lot more complicated than that. It's like Disney World. You go through these rides and every little room is a different ride. So I'm looking at 20,000 power right yeah. now in this one tank. Give them a tank. Wow. Yeah. Power party. Yeah, power party. Kia ora anō, no mai, welcome back to Voice of Tangaroa. Ko Kate Evans tēnei, freelance science journalist. Ko Clerkin Kananaho, presenter and producer of Our Changing World. And what are we wading into today, Kate? Well, around the world and here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, human populations are growing, and many of us want to eat delicious fish and seafood. The trouble is, almost all wild fisheries are pretty much maxed out. We're taking as much as we can sustainably take, and in some cases we're even taking more than that. So to meet that growing demand, people are turning to what's actually a very old tradition, farming fish. An old tradition? I kind of had the impression that farming fish is relatively new. It's actually been happening for about 5,000 years in China. But back then, that was mostly freshwater fish like carp and lakes. And for a few decades now, we've been farming salmon in pens in the ocean. Weren't there a lot of issues with that? Yeah, there have been some issues with waste polluting the surrounding seas and diseases spreading to wild fish, although that last one isn't a problem here since we have no wild salmon. I've been told that it's a lot cleaner and more regulated now, especially in New Zealand. Although environmental groups are concerned that the fast-track approvals bill announced by the government in March 2024 in an attempt to grow the industry might erode this. But I wanted to focus on those companies and researchers that have been problem-solving how to grow fish on land. Somewhere that's become something of a hub for this is a large facility at Ocean Beach in Bluff, a place that started life very differently. So this sort of area outside the hatchery is we're in the slaughter board. This is Blair Wolfgram, businessman, property investor and co-founder of the New Zealand Abalone Company. He bought Ocean Beach in 2018. This was um, essentially where the lambs were processed on chains in this area. So if you look down the far end there, uh, the animals would be brought in through the door Um, slaughtered at that junction and then hung up on chains that ran through this these sort of structures here there were eight chains along here and then there would be butchers standing on either side of each chain and the blood would drip down into these drains that now we have seawater dripping through Uh, and then there was these big holes here you can see that we've filled in where the guts and the pelts um, would drop down to the floor below and then be processed down there as well, so. Yeah, yeah, gory. Yeah, super gory, but um, it's sort of wonderful to have it come back to life in a way. Yeah, you know? so. and I suppose you're still growing and killing animals, it's just not quite as hardcore as. Yeah, <laughs> most of our product goes out alive. Oh, does it? Someone else kills someone it, else. someone else. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think the fact that we are growing something and, and I would think there will always be something growing in here now. Ocean Beach closed as a meatworks in 1991, but apparently still holds the national record for the most lambs slaughtered in a day, 20,000. That is impressive and horrifying at the same time. Exactly where is this place? As you come into Bluff, there's this narrow strip of land with the sheltered Bluff Harbour on one side and the wild Fovo Strait on the other. I visited on a stormy Southland day. Rain showers, strong winds, waves battering at the rocks. There are about 50 buildings in the Ocean Beach complex and from the outside, Claire, it looks like a collection of crumbling haunted houses. Salt lash concrete, graffiti, peeling paint and dribbles of rust that look eerily like blood. Inside, though, it's teeming with technology and life. It's like Disney World. You go through these rides and every little room is a different ride. Professor Andrea Alfaro is a marine ecologist and aquaculture researcher from Auckland University of Technology and the chief scientist for Ocean Beach. It's got its magic and it's got its ups and downs and its scary bits and its fun bits and 
and it's just you never know what you're going to find around the corner. Every day it's like, oh, I wonder how I could do this differently. And then when you see these tanks working and there's rows and rows and rows as far as you can see, it's, it's a really great feeling. There's an estimated eight to 900,000 power above three months old in this facility with expansion plans in the works. I'm about to get the Disney World tour and a journey through the life cycle of power. We start in the hatchery, which also goes by another moniker. The hatchery is actually called the Boom Boom Room. This is where power get it on. The brood stock consists of around a thousand large adult power, which were sourced from Rakiura, Stewart Island. But don't picture mood lighting and Barry White playing. It's significantly less romantic. The idea is to have adults, uh, males and females in different tanks. And then we try different spawning techniques to get them to produce their gametes, the eggs and the sperm. We keep those separate and then we mix them so that the sperm fertilize the egg and we get embryos developing. Andrea shows me the specialised tanks where the water's constantly moving to keep the fertilised embryos in suspension. During the next you know, 24 hours to 48 hours, they will just develop into larvae. And the idea is to produce as many as we can for these competent larvae to swim about. And they swim for about seven days without feeding. And after about seven to ten days, they've used up everything they have and now they need to settle. In the ocean, these microscopic larvae are held up by waves and currents. When they land on a part of the seabed with the right mix of seaweeds, it triggers them to change from a swimming larva to something that looks like a microscopic garden snail. To farm power, then, you need to get the seaweed garden spot on. Usually in the wild, they have chemical cues from some of the red seaweeds. They're encrusting red seaweeds on the rocks or on the shells of the other adults in the habitat. Oh, like they can sense the presence of those and then yeah. they want to settle in those yeah. places. That's a cue to settle. This is a good habitat. The other parents are, are moving around, so it's probably a good indication that there's food there that they will then be able to eat when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So we try to mimic that kind of condition growing different kinds of microalgae and conditioning that on the surfaces of the tanks. It's like a garden. You provide the right garden for them to go in there. When they hit that surface, the chemical cues that induce that metamorphosis. And at that point, they become literally changed from that swimming uh, individual into a little tiny snail. And with this metamorphosis comes a digestive tract. They start eating like crazy. They just go all like a snail, literally in your garden when they go at night and they start making those little trails, feeding on anything, that's what they do. Because abalone around the world have a similar life cycle, the team didn't have to start from absolute scratch, but it still took some time and problem solving to figure out the best conditions for farming New Zealand power. But now they've got it sussed. We're in Kindy 1. Essentially we have three kindies. Um, where the larvae are seeded into these tanks that have the algal substrate. Did he say kindy one, as in kindergarten? Yeah, I mean, it's the natural progression from the boom boom room to kindy. <laughs> so, so the tanks in here then, are they full of these little baby power snails? Can you see them? Not yet. At the start you can't see them at all, they're microscopic at first. And then they become just tiny little glints in the seawater. You wouldn't know that there was any power in there how at all. Many, how many power in here that we can't see? If you actually look vertically down, you can see those little white dots. On the side or on the bottom? Well, no, they're all suspended. So oh, they're all in still, the water. they've still got their feather. Oh, oh, so they're okay. still swimming no, I around. I see them. I was looking yep. at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, they're okay. just little dots. Like um, a grain of extremely fine sand. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, there they or are. Icing sugar type stuff. Yeah, right. yeah, like a piece of icing sugar. Yeah. That's good. Hi, little power. When the guys first showed me this, when I this was uh, three years ago when we did our first ever seeding, they said this tank is full of 10,000 power. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me because literally it looks like seawater, right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then within six weeks, you can actually see them tiny dots. I'll show you another tank. Um, and then after sort of 12 weeks, you can really see them. They're like kind of emerging out of nothing. Yeah. Blair took me through the kindies, filled with so many tanks containing power of all different ages so I could see this progression. 
At about six weeks, they stop looking like a snail and start to have that familiar power shape. At about 10 to 12 weeks, they're between sesame and sunflower seed size, and that's when they look like teeny little power. Cute! As they get bigger, do they just keep topping up their seaweed? Well, at about four or five months, they move to the next phase when they're kind of olive size. And then they get fed a specific food made on site, a secret recipe developed by Andrea's team. It's all New Zealand ingredients. And, um, yeah, we're, we're trialling different kinds of sustainable products. Like waste products from things? Waste products from other things. Try to use as much as we can to recycle and, and you know, give it the power, the best opportunity to grow as well. I mean, a good balance of all the right nutrients that it needs to grow as fast as possible, as healthy as possible, as happy as possible. And as tasty as possible. And as tasty as possible. I didn't get a chance to taste these power, but they look amazing. In the wild, algae and lichen camouflage the outer shell of power. Here, with filtered water, regularly cleaned tanks and their special diet, they're just gorgeous. These are the first big ones that I've seen, or not, like not fully grown yeah. juveniles, but they're the most incredible colour. Yes. Like a beautiful turquoise blue. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that power looked like this. Honestly, Claire, I was blown away by the sight of thousands of them in these shallow tanks, like a pile of blue treasure. I guess they are a kind of treasure to the team, or at least they will be when they're ready for harvest. How long does that take? Power actually live for about 20 years, so it can take at least six years to grow to full adult size. But the company sells them at what they call cocktail size, around eight centimetres long, which they reach at three to five years. They're more tender at this size and a rare treat because it's illegal to take wild power when they're this small. So far, they've been selling them within New Zealand to high-end restaurants and some fish markets. They plan to export them one day, but they'll need to get a lot more tanks cranking to meet that demand. We definitely would like more and more stock and then you know there's, there's definitely um, strong demand out there obviously for a price too so that's always um, the tension. Mm, prices and tension. I guess at the end of the day it is a business. Absolutely and it's not the only one at the Ocean Beach Complex. There are two different seaweed startups here too but it's the fourth company Menaki Whitebait that's also trying to farm fish on land. Today, Manaki Whitebait is owned by the Ngati Tahu Ngati Whaua Runanga Trust, a central North Island hapu, who saw both financial and environmental possibilities in domesticating whitebait. But the company can trace its roots back to conservation. We soon realised that obviously no one wants to pay for uh, these fish to be reintroduced and we had to work out a way to fund it. And that evolved into can we commercialise the species and then as a quid pa quo, have our releases as an advantage, as a, as a clip-on to that commercial process. Paul Decker is the general manager of Monarchy Whitebait. 20 years ago, the company started a native fish recovery program with the idea that they would breed native fish for release into restored habitats. To fund it, they thought they'd also breed some to sell. Easy to say, turns out not so easy to do. More issues than uh, you'd ever, ever dream of. <laughs> But uh, there have been challenges and um, we're getting through all the challenges and mm. we're looking forward to some great white bait fritters in the new year. Sounds like it's been an absolute mission just to grow some baby fish. Why so complicated, Kate? Well, a number of reasons. First, remember white bait isn't a single species of fish. White bait is a collective term of five fish, actually. You have the uh, giant cockapoo, the enunga, the kararo the short-jawed cockapoo and the banded cockapoo. Second, they move around during their life cycle. They live in fresh water all their adult life and they spawn in fresh water. The eggs hatch in fresh water and then they wash out to sea as babies. They stay out to sea for anywhere from three to six months and uh, then as they're swimming around the coast of New Zealand they decide to go back up the river and that's where they stay for the rest of their adult life. And it's as they return from the ocean to the river that they get caught and served up as whitebait fritters. So you've got different species, each with a fairly complicated life cycle. And the team ran into a big problem early on. We started uh, with breeding the whole five of the whitebait species with the idea that the marketplace is used to a mixed species tub of fish. 
And we soon discovered that that was very difficult because the inanga uh, eats three kilos of food, makes one kilo of, of white bait. It, it's hyperactive as an animal. It's funny. It's, uh, it actually just doesn't stop eating. It doesn't grow that big as an adult, but it certainly doesn't stop eating as a white bait. Because it's just hooning around so much. It's oh, hooning yeah. it all off. And it eats all of its cousins. It eats all of the others. others. It's quite carnivorous. And so when, when we went to harvest out of a mixed tank, we only got inanga because it ate everybody else. That is a tough first lesson. So I guess separate tanks for everybody from then on. Yeah, they separated out all the species. And they still grow them all for the range reduction side of things. But they decided to hone in on just one for their commercial farming, the giant cockapoo mainly because of something called its feed conversion ratio. What's that? Well, you know how Paul said you have to feed Eninger three kilos of food for one kilo of white bait? That's the feed conversion ratio. You want it to be as low as possible. For giant cockapoo, this number is 1.2. So you put in 1.2 kilos of food and you get one kilo of giant cockapoo white bait. So that's good? Yeah, that's really good. By comparison, for New Zealand farmed Chinook salmon, it's 1.8. For beef, it's like six to 10. And for lamb, it's almost 20. So the team leaned into the giant cockapoo farming, but that came with its own set of surprising challenges. When we would come to work, they'd all climb out of the tank. What do you mean? Well, they climb when they're larvae, and so you'd have them in the tank, and then you come and they've all climbed out. And they won't, they won't, they'd be lying around on the floor. Yeah, and some of them, most of them did because they've dehydrated. They've been out all night. So that was a, a game changer, was that we um, paint the top of the tank black and they won't climb on black. Now, I said the Monarchy Whitebait is based in Bluff, but I'm actually talking to Paul in Walkworth. They've moved part of their operation down to take advantage of the South Island's colder temperatures and ocean beaches' access to seawater. And if you thought the farmed Pawa's love life was a bit sad... We fly eggs down there from Walkworth. We put the eggs on the Air New Zealand and off they go down to Bluff. I guess they don't take up much space, do they? Five kilos of eggs is only a tub of eggs. The female giant cockapoo in Walkworth but the males are in bluff, so it's a long-distance relationship. The eggs are stripped from the sedated mothers by hand and sent south where they get mixed with the male's milt, or fish semen. To make this work commercially, you need year-round production. To explain, Paul brings me into the tank room where the adult females are kept. We have them under conditions where we have them out of season. So each fish only breeds once a year. Right. But we're able to breed fish 52 weeks of the year. How do you convince them that it's a different time of year? Oh, by temperature and light. Oh, OK. So the, the, the lights uh, put on the uh, natural day length to suit the season, and the, and the water temperature is done the same. And Claire, when he lifted the barrier on top, honestly, I felt like a little kid at an aquarium. Oh, and here they are. Here's the fishies. Ah, you sound so excited. Well, they're a really pretty fish. They have these leopard-type spots and the adults can get quite big. We think of them as tiny white bait, but these large females can live for about 30 years, get up to 50 centimetres in length and weigh two and a half kilos. But I got even more excited down in Bluff when the operations manager, Michael Mears, showed me the babies. Wow, there's so many tiny white bait in here. (laughs) Look at them, they're all see-through, with little black eyes. They're so cute. Oh, I do love them. I do love them. How many are in this tank? In this tank, I think we had a hatch of 700,000. Oh, wow. I like how some of them are swimming one way and some of them are <laughs> swimming the other way. Oh, they're going to go crazy. It's nearly food time, so they're Ooh, trying to I find watch it. Can get fed? Of course, of course. Full on kid in aquarium vibes. <laughs> I know. But I was also feeding off Michael's excitement and energy. He's one of Andrea's former students. He's 23 and he loves his job even if he had to work during the Men's Rugby World Cup final last year. These guys, we were busy hatching them out the jars on the morning of the World Cup final. So what did you call them? Uh, <laughs> defeat. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Barnes. Sad day at work. Yeah, mm. no, it was very fun. We've got the speaker going. Didn't spill any white bait, but it was close. It takes about 80 days from the eggs hatching until the white bait are ready to harvest. Michael's team scoops them up in a big net, drains the water and pops them into a giant cooler at one degree Celsius. By now, this batch will have already been harvested and on their way to customers. Hopefully they taste sweeter than that rugby defeat. Demand is not an issue, I'll say that. Right. Uh, everyone frickin' wants it. Being, you know, farm premium product, um, it's quite in demand for restaurants. Um, but we do have it slated, I believe, to go to supermarkets eventually. Mm. 
Yes, that's the goal. My, the goal would, it would be nice to have every New Zealander have a chance to have sustainably caught farmed white bait so they have no need to buy from people exploiting wild catch, I suppose. More for people going fishing, but um, people will catch tons and tons and tons and, and it's kind of devastating the wild a little bit. So as long as New Zealanders have the option to buy farmed white bait, uh, it's a, it's a sustainable, that's the goal, mm. or at least it is for me. I'm just a fish nerd who really likes, um, I love white bait, it's very delicious, but I also very much like the adult species and they're very, very important. They don't get enough um, recognition but I would very much like to help the species come back from the brink. Paul did say that they started with a conservation focus. How close to the brink are these fish? All our native galaxid species are in trouble, and the giant kakapu is on international endangered species lists as vulnerable and decreasing. And Claire, by Doc's estimates on the wild population and Paul's counts, there are more female giant cockapoo in tanks in Walkworth than there are in the wild. That's staggering and quite sad. How did we get here? As with many species, it's not just one thing that's getting them. It's land use change, loss of habitat, water quality issues, damming or modifying streams, sucking water from rivers, brown trout snacking on them, and yes, us turning them into fritters. There are restrictions on timing and net size and placement, but there's no quota on the wild catch for whitebait. Within the season and the rules, people can catch and sell as much as they like. While he believes the commercial fishery is dying along with the fish, Paul Decker wants to be clear that Menaki whitebait doesn't aim to replace the recreational and customary fisheries. Wild fishery is a wonderful thing, and it's something that all our children should have that cultural experience and you should be able to have enough white bait for recreational fishing. I, I think that it, there's a big difference between recreational fishing and commercial fishing. Paul grew up on a dairy farm in rural Queensland and he believes farming is the future if we want to keep eating fish. The deficit of wild harvest of any species has to be made up by farming. You cannot continue in a population of human beings that we have on planet Earth to take from the wild. So Kate, do you think that's where we're heading? In the future, will the majority of our fish be farmed? I'm not sure. Not every fish lends itself to farming. Paul's story about the white bait is evidence of that. There'll be some it just won't make economic, scientific or practical sense to farm. But the current government has committed to expanding New Zealand aquaculture. Yeah, I spoke to the Minister for Oceans and Fisheries, Shane Jones, about this recently. He says they're aiming to increase annual aquaculture sales sixfold to $6 billion by 2040 through fast-tracking consent approvals for aquaculture and extending existing permits. Right. NGOs like the Environmental Defence Society and Forest and Bird, though, are concerned that fast-tracking approvals will give too much power to ministers to grant consents, even against expert advice. And that extending existing permits as is will mean ignoring everything we've learned over the past few years about how to make aquaculture more environmentally responsible. Either way, looks like aquaculture is here to stay and is set to get plenty of encouragement from the beehive. But I wonder about these farms on land, Kate. I mean, what are the advantages versus farming in the sea? Well, basically that you have greater control over everything. Like some of the things we've talked about. You can control the temperature and light to ensure year-round supply of fish. But also, it takes up less space. Your farmed fish never interact with wild ones. The farms are more protected from storms and marine heat waves. And depending on the setup, you can treat and reuse the water, making it quite efficient. That's exactly what they have going on in Niwa's Northland Aquaculture Facility in Ruakaka, just south of Whangarei. Here's Andrew Forsyth, Chief Scientist for Aquaculture and Biotechnology at Niwa. So you're taking the water that comes out of the ocean out, out here? We take the water Ruakaka. out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. We put it through a pre-treatment, which includes taking the particulates out and sterilising it. It goes into the farm. In the farm, the water goes to the fish, comes out of the tanks, the particles are removed. It goes into a biological treatment system that removes the waste that the fish produce. Then we actually pass it through a UV sterilizer. Then we remove the carbon dioxide, which is the other waste the fish produce. Oh, yeah. And then we have some refinement treatments on the side, and it's pumped back to the fish. And before it goes back into the fish tank, we add extra oxygen. 
Okay. And that loop goes round and round and round. We're recycling between 95 and 99 percent of the water. Andrew and aquaculture scientist Dr. Alvin Sitiawan take me for a tour. So this is one of our oh, production yeah. tanks. Oh my God! Look at them. It's really big. They're really big. Yeah. They're, they're not our biggest. They've got this massive setup where they've been doing research into farming native yellowtail kingfish, or haku. And they've been working through the same puzzles as the companies down south, figuring out what the kingfish need to survive and to grow as fast as possible. The feed conversion ratio, that magic food to flesh number, for haku it's about 1.5, really good. Niwa's first commercial harvest of one tonne took place in January, and now they're up to two tonnes a week. In two years' time, they aim to produce 600 tonnes per year, about the same amount of kingfish as recreational fishers catch each year, and three times what the commercial boats haul in. We're not interested in conflating our product with wild kingfish. Mm. I, I think that's, that's important. It's a, it's a very different offering mm. because it's a, it's a smaller fish. It's got different eating characteristics. It's got continuous availability. It's quite a different product. It's kind of something new. It's new. Yeah. yeah. This is because of the control over their breeding, eating and harvesting. But with this greater control also comes greater responsibility. So you're pumping water, you're providing oxygen, you're treating the waste. You can't turn it off. It can never turn off. So it needs continuous monitoring, it needs backup systems, it needs redundancy. So all that engineering kind of all that engi in place. And, and so to put all that engineering in place, to justify it, you need scale. It's funny, I mean, we've been farming animals for a long time, but somehow this sits weird with me especially the kingfish. I don't know why, but power, I was like, ah, yeah, sure, keep them in tanks. You know, they're shellfish, they don't move much. And whitebait are so teeny that they surely don't need much space anyway. But a kingfish is a big fish. Are they happy in these tanks? You know, it was a really strange sight seeing thousands of fish in these tanks just swimming in circles. I asked Alvin if he thinks they get bored. He told me about a master's student that did an experiment putting Lego in the tanks to see how the fish would react, if they'd be entertained. And you know what, the kingfish, they don't care. They really don't care about the Lego. They just look at ah, you swim around it. So I guess as a... <laughs> she still has to analyse it, but just looking at those videos to me, yeah, these fish are pretty good in, in this environment. They really don't care. A lot of the people I spoke to for the story came from farming backgrounds or were fish lovers from childhood, and they point out that these fish are bred to be farmed and never know the open ocean. Is it crueler to keep a fish in a tank versus a sheep in a paddock? I don't know. I did speak to University of Auckland marine scientist Professor Andrew Jeffs, who told me that there is evidence to suggest that fish are actually pretty smart, but that in the wild most fish are pretty much starving. Their lives are basically focused on finding a meal. In the tanks, they don't have to worry about that, so he thinks they're probably relatively happy in confinement. The other big question that came up for me is whether domesticating these native species might change what they mean to us. As in how we feel about eating them? Yeah, like, does our relationship with kai change when it's tamed? Fish have been called the last wild food. Do we think differently of fish that's been farmed rather than hauled in from the ocean? There is a big difference, people I spoke to said, especially tangata whenua, if you catch it yourself. But for most of us, we're just grabbing things from a supermarket shelf or ordering off a menu. I mean, the only constant is change, right? We're constantly changing how we live and consume as a society. And I guess if we want to have fish in the wild and eat our fish cakes too, then maybe we do need to farm them and just accept that. Yeah. But I should point out that a 2019 study of global aquaculture did find that farming on its own rarely shifts pressure off wild stocks and may even help to increase our appetites for fish products, though it can also help to meet that demand. But as fisheries come under increased pressure and also face pollution and climate change, it's possible that one day tamed versions of pawa, kingfish or whitebait might be the only kind we can get. In which case, we'll be glad of these people figuring out all the puzzles of how to farm them. So, the, so some little pellets have just fallen out of the, the hopper and the fish are going absolutely nuts trying to get some for themselves and sort of swarming all over each other. And then as the food stops dropping, they just start swimming normally, like, nothing to see here.
That was science journalist Kate Evans, who researched and reported this story for New Zealand Geographic. She spoke to Blair Wolfgram, Professor Andrea Alfaro, Paul Decker, Michael Mears, Dr. Andrew Forsyth, and Dr. Alvin Setiawan. Voice of Tangaroa is a joint production between RNZ's Our Changing World and New Zealand Geographic. New Zealand Geographic reporting on the Voice of Tangaroa is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. You can learn more and read the articles for free at nzgeo.com forward slash seas. Kate Evans and Richard Robinson are the main journalist and photographer of the series, and additional reporting was done by Bill Morris. This episode was produced by Kate Evans and me, Claire Kincannon, with help from Ellen Rikers and Brianna Juritich. Thanks to senior producer Phil Vine for editing help. Sound engineering was by William Saunders, and executive producers are Tim Watkin of RNZ and James Frankham of New Zealand Geographic. Original music for this series was created by the Wellington band Grains. You can find them on Spotify. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Te nākwe i mai. Thanks so much for listening. Ko kreakin kanana ho, mā te wā.